So my name is Mike Hoover, as she said. I'm the treasurer for the Spring Hill Cemetery, and I'm referring to the one on Macklemore, not on 31. Does everyone know where the cemetery is on Macklemore? So that's the old Spring Hill Cemetery, as we call it. Um, so the way I got involved with the cemetery, I actually have no connection to Spring Hill. I originally was helping them identify Confederate veterans buried in the mass grave from the Civil War. In 2012, uh, an employee at Ripa Villa found the names of 39 people that were listed in a newspaper article that were killed during the war and buried there. In order to mark them, we had to find their service record in order to get a marker from, the, from Veterans Affairs. So I was helping with that. The previous cemetery board members said they were getting old and didn't want to do it anymore. And I was approached about being the treasurer. So. Um, originally, I told my wife that I was just going to have to pay the mowers. And now whenever I call someone, she's like, I thought that's all you had to do is just pay the lawn mowers. And now you're calling all these people. So. Anyway, I've gotten really interested in the cemetery and the residents, as we call them. And then I'll give you a brief uh, history of it. So this is an actually an older map from the cemetery. As you can see, the Rosenwald School is still shown on here. This way is actually north, and this is Macklemore Avenue and Walnut Street. Uh, the three sections I'm going to talk about is the main cemetery, the Confederate mass graves, and the colored cemetery, as it's normally referred to on most records. Just to give you a history of the cemetery, uh, the first burial we found is from 1839, and it's Nancy Owen. <clears throat> she was three months old uh, when she passed away. Her parents are in the cemetery, so we're not really sure who her parents are or where they went afterwards. She has what I think is a sister, just two graves over from her, and a uh, she had been 16 years older than her, so maybe a cousin or something, or it possibly could be an older sister, but we don't really know a whole lot about her. People were buried in the cemetery for nine years after that. And then in 1848, Dr. Haddock sells his land to Martin Chairs, and he leaves an acre set aside to be used as a city cemetery. And that's when it officially becomes a cemetery, according to, I guess, government records. The cemetery was originally segregated with uh, the eastern section being designated the colored cemetery, but the first burial in there is not till 50 years after Nancy dies. So I don't know if it was uh, originally set up as that, but I will get into that a little bit more as we go. Uh, Confederates killed in this area during the war were brought here to be reinterred by Martha Bond in 1866, a year after the war ended. But it wasn't until 1922 that a cemetery board was actually set up to take care of the cemetery. Uh, they increased the cemetery from one acre to three acres by 1944. And uh, I was going to say we have veterans from the Civil War of Vietnam buried there. And this is a picture of our first burial. This is Nancy Owen. Uh, if you take a look right here, you can see there's this dirt line. So if you look at the cemetery sign, it says 1840. That's because the records we had said that's when she died. But then when we actually pulled her tombstone up, we saw it was 1839. So whenever we replace the sign, we're going to fix the year too. 
Most of the historic homes that you see in Spring Hill, the builder or the owner is buried in the cemetery. So we have Dr. Aaron White and his brother George White. They're both the son of General William White, who was a general at the Battle of <clears throat> New Orleans under Jackson. And he's most famous for losing a duel to Sam Houston. He survived, he got shot in the groin, but he survived it and his shot completely missed Sam Houston. <laughs> but that was his big claim to fame. <laughs> uh, one interesting, I don't have a picture of it on here, but their dad's house in East Nashville was called White Hall, and the, his grandfather's house in, I think it was Virginia, was called White Hall, so that was a reoccurring name. And then also, the White Blair house here, if you, before they tore it down in 1992, that's actually the mirror image of his boyhood home. So the bay windows are on the left on the house in Nashville, the two-story porch is on the right. So uh, it's pretty easy to figure out where he got his design from. We also have the Hardin House. Uh, Dr. Hardin was a physician, and you also notice a lot of these people are doctors, the houses that are still standing. Uh, he was a physician here in town. He, uh, his dad was in charge of the female academy in town, and he moved here from New Orleans to be with his dad. He uh, studied under Dr. Aaron White and ended up marrying his niece, who was the daughter of George White, and that's who his wife Margaret is right there. Uh, he actually bought, when he bought the land that his house is on, he had a way bigger house and he tore it down and built a smaller one. Now, whether or not it's true, he always told people he built a smaller house because his wife had too much company over. <laughs> um, we also got, uh, Ferguson Hall right here. Uh, that was Martin Chair's house. <clears throat> Uh, it's claim to fame is General Van Dorn got shot in the back room by Dr. Peters in there. Uh, his house was the headquarters for General Stanley during the uh, Battle of Spring Hill. And uh, the Union Army ripped up all his fences to build uh, defense around his property during the Battle of Spring Hill. So his house was, his property was pretty wrecked during the war. After he dies, he sells his property to Branham and Hughes and... Uh, the house gets renamed Ferguson Hall. That's what it's normally known as today. We also got doctor, the doctor's shop, which is the oldest building in town. Uh, Dr. Gorham Wing was from Maine. After he got his medical degree, he moved to North Carolina and then traveled with, a, it just said, a group of immigrants to Tennessee, and that's how he ended up here. Uh, I don't have a photo of him. But he does, I think I mentioned he has the oldest house in town. And of course, here's the McKissick house and a picture of William McKissick. Uh, his house was the headquarters for General Schofield during the Battle of Spring Hill, but he had passed away by that point. And an interesting story about him, he was originally buried behind the Hardin house. And in the 1890s, they moved him, I think they said to build a road. Uh, when you move somebody, what you, would you naturally do? Just pop the casket open and see what's in there, right? <laughs> That's what they did with him and his wife. So he was in an excellent state of preservation after being dead for 40 years, and they said his wife had red hair, which nobody knew. So. <laughs> and then probably one of the most favorite uh, stories from the cemetery, of course, is the kissing house. So Sarah Odell lived near where... Uh, I think it's Royal Oaks Boulevard, where the police station is off the Kedron Road. That was her childhood home. She fell in love with a guy 27 years older than her. He spent one day with her, asked her dad if he could marry her. He agreed. He gave her money to go buy a ring, and then about a week afterwards, <coughs> I guess, had uh, buyer's remorse. <coughs> and depending on whose story you believe, even though he was in his 50s, he sent his sister to go talk to Sarah Odell. He claims it was to end the marriage. She claims it was to postpone it. Uh, most of the people in town agreed that they thought she was still engaged. 
but three years after this, he, she's still waiting for their marriage to take place when her dad picks up a newspaper and sees that he just married someone else. <laughs> she takes him to court for breach of contract. It goes to the Tennessee Supreme Court, and she wins. And there was also an embarrassment to her ex-fiance because they revealed that he wasn't as rich as he claimed to be. But she used the money to buy the kissing house right here, which is not too far off uh, Macklemore. I was going to get into the colored cemetery. So this is the deed that Fink created the cemetery. So in 1872, Calvin Sharper, Peter Sharper, and Jeff Peters, trustees of the Colored Emmy Church, bought an acre of land directly east of the cemetery from Martin Shares. And you can even see here, beginning at a stake at the southeast corner of the graveyard, uh, so he's got the lot directly east of it. And I took a look at these guys. There's actually a third sharper. And one thing that these four men have over a lot of former ex-slaves is they had a skilled trade coming out of slavery. Calvin Sharper can build wagons. Uh, Peter and Matt can both are both blacksmiths. And Jeff Peters runs a shoe store in Spring Hill. So by 1872, they're wealthy enough that they can start buying land. Kelvin Sharper actually owns a 30-acre farm by this point. This is a map from 1878, just to show you. So here's Kelvin Sharper's house right across the street from Dr. White. Peter Sharper's got a house right here behind the Methodist Church. And by the way, this is Duplex, Main Street, Macklemore, and School Street. So that helps you kind of get your bearings. Matt Sharper owns a house directly next to the Presbyterian Church. And you can see by 1878, Jeff Peters has this lot right next to the cemetery, which I just showed you the deed for, and his shoe store is right here behind uh, where Verizon is now. I don't know if he bought the other ones out or if they just picked one of the names on the deed, but this is shown as his property. And the first burial in the Colored Cemetery is his daughter-in-law, who died in 1888. Her name was Frances, and I think that may have been what started it. So I don't know if they originally intended to build a church here, because Wesley Chapel ended up going right here where A. Macklemore is. Or if he just donated the land after he started burying his family there. But there's 34 marked graves. We don't have any records of who's buried there. Um, originally, I was looking at death certificates, trying to find Nate, like if they said Spring Hill, I'm like, okay, you must be in there. Well, then I decided to check Newtown, and I picked about 10 people, and three of the people I looked at said they were buried in Spring Hill, even though they have a tombstone in Newtown. So I can't even use that as an actual guide for whether or not they're there or not. I think Spring Hill is just small enough, they just wrote Spring Hill is where you're being buried. So a um, few of the people I've been able to uh, research. First one, and he was very famous in Spring Hill, is Sam Bond. He was born a slave. He was on the plantation of Thomas Bond, which is about where Walmart is, now off of 31. Uh, he stated his dad worked on the farm and his mom worked in the house, and he helped his mom until he was about 10. Then he said he learned how to drive a wagon and he drove his master's kids to school. And then on Sundays, he drove his, uh, the family to the Methodist church and he said he sat on the back row with all the other drivers. Uh, after the war, he gets a job as the uh, farm manager for Ripa Villa, which he works at for several decades. Uh, he finally retires from that. His son takes it over. And he becomes a undertaker in town. He had, they said for funerals, he had two really dark black horses. He had a hearse that was glass with plumes on each side. And he put two giant plumes in the horses' heads. And that's what he would take them to the cemetery in. So he went from slave to farm manager to self-employed businessman in his lifetime. Another 
resident that I'm still doing a lot more research on is Professor John Byers and his wife Martha. Martha is the daughter of Calvin Sharper. Uh, I think she's what brought him here. Uh, he states he was born in Santa Fe. He goes to Central College to get his education. And then uh, I found him in the 1870s census and he's living with two, an elderly white couple and I think the mother-in-law of the um, house owner. So I think they kind of adopted him and then they started paying for a lot of his stuff. The owner, his former owner eventually moves to Hickman County and I found a thing saying that he was going on vacation to Hickman County to visit his family. So I think that's who he considered his family to be, but I'm still in the process of researching that. When he was a professor of the card school here in Spring Hill, it was at St. Mark's Church. That's where they operated out of. He um, never taught at the Rosenwald School. He passed away before then. Uh, this is a picture of his house. It was standing till 2017 when they widened Duplex Road and the fire department used it for practice. Uh, next up is the Civil War section, which had a very large impact. There's actually probably as many Confederate graves in the cemetery as there is any other war combined. So in 1866, Martha Bond from Spring Hill starts, puts an uh, article in the paper and says, I'm moving all the bodies that are just scattered around the area and I'm bringing them to the cemetery. There's, we do know a few of them were buried in the cemetery when they were killed initially. Uh, most of them are from when the General Van Dorn occupied this area in spring of 1863. And we're not sure if there's more graves than what she has listed because she only has 39, and this does not represent <coughs> all the casualties from those battles. Here's a picture of the Confederate section. The large marker in the back is for Captain Sam Freeman. Uh, his, he made headlines across the South because he was killed after he surrendered. Uh, Battle of Franklin on uh, April 10, 1863. So this is a map showing almost every body buried in the cemetery is from one of these three battles. So the first one being the Battle of Thompson Station on March 5th, the Battle of Franklin on April 10th, 18, both of those 1863, and of course the Battle of Spring Hill on November 29th, 1864. There's a few other ones that were killed on picket duty, but that seems to be the bulk of where they came from. And during the Battle of Spring Hill, the cemetery was almost a battlefield. As you can see right here, the after action reports from the Federal Army said they formed a line on the rise right above the cemetery, and then they had a skirmish line out by the creek on the other side. The Confederates never attacked this area, so there's no damage to the cemetery. Uh, here's a few photos of people that were buried in the cemetery that I've been able to obtain. Colonel Samuel Earl was a uh, colonel of the 3rd <coughs> Arkansas Cavalry. He shot in the forehead near Homestead Manor and killed instantly. This is Harry Hill. He's from Arkansas. He was killed instantly at the Battle of Spring Hill on November 29th. Alfred Byrd is mortally wounded on at the Battle of Spring Hill, and he actually dies three weeks later. And William McFadden here was on picket duty, and uh, on an after-action report, I found the Federals during the night snuck up on their line and then just rushed them, and he was one of the men killed. A few other Confederate veterans buried in the cemetery uh, that had a prominent place in Spring Hill. This is Joseph Alexander. He becomes the postmaster of Spring Hill after the war. Uh, the White House at the corner of School Street and Duplex is called the Alexander House. That's where his house was. He also ran a general store. 
in the trenches around Jackson, Mississippi in May of 1863. He, they have a fire built in there and his lieutenant hands him a pipe and says, will you light this? As he goes to hand it back, a federal sharpshooter puts a round through his chest. He actually survives it, but the wounds, the complications from it kill him later in life. This is El Alfonso McKissick. He's uh, the son of Orville and Eleanor McKissick of the McKissick House. He is wounded at Raymond, Mississippi and spends the rest of the war in a prison camp. And after the war, he's the druggist in town. Right here, we have John Nichols. He's a Methodist reverend. And this is his brother right here. I'm not sure the names of these other two. You can't really tell, but this is an empty sleeve. His brother had his arm amputated after the Battle of Perrysville, Kentucky. And you can see this cane here that he walked with the rest of his life. At the Battle of Murfreesboro, he shot in the hip. And the bullet is not actually removed till eight years after the war ended. And I mentioned Dr. Hardin earlier. Uh, he was in the Light Cavalry. He left medical school to enlist in the military and actually served as a general escort during the whole war. And of course, he was a longtime physician in Spring Hill. And of course, we only have two federal burials in the cemetery. Uh, neither man is from Spring Hill, and I'm not really sure what made them move here. Uh, this is a tombstone we just put in. Uh, his name is Palatan Chapman. Uh, that's Pocahontas' dad, if you're wondering where that name came from. That's also a county in Virginia. Uh, usually, federal pension records are a wealth of information, and these two are not. So, I know he was born in Virginia. By the time of the Civil War, he's living in Limestone County, Alabama. He enlists in the 40th United States Colored Troop. He serves till 1866, and just a few months later, he marries Louisa Bright in, at Carter's Creek. Neither Louisa or him are from this area, so I don't know what brought them here. But I did see the reverend that married him has the last name Chapman, so I don't know if he had some family here and that just brought him here. Um, he's part of sounds like it's something along the lines of the Mosaic Templars of America, if any of you are familiar with them. They uh, basically gave benefits to African Americans throughout the South, and he, in the 1905 history of Murray County, he's listed as running that in Spring Hill. Uh, he ended up building a house next to Matt Sharper in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, the other one is Alexander Forbes. He's from, he's from Michigan. He's in the 8th Michigan Cavalry. He does serve in this area during the war. He was at the Battle of Spring Hill. Uh, 20 years after the war ends, he moves here and lives off of Greens Mill Road. I don't know why he's here or what brought him here, but maybe he liked the area when he moved down here, but he ends up being buried here too. And then, Two more stories that I usually like to share with people. Uh, World War One. So this is Sim Watson. He lives off of Depot Street, and he enlists in the 30th Infantry Division. He's in the 114th Field Artillery. Uh, you can see the campaigns he served in. So he makes it through the whole war without a scratch. They get orders in 1919 to move to port, they're going home. They're being shipped back to the US. On the way there, he's on a train that brakes were not checked, and as they're going downhill, there's another train stopped in the tracks. The trains collide, it's at the, all the first five cars telescope, and he's in one of the first five cars. He's buried in France, and he stays there till 1921, when he, his parents say they want to bring him back to the US, so he's shipped back. Uh, in World War I, a lot of the units were still like local, so most of his battery lived, is still living in this area, so they actually get to be his honor guard at his funeral when they re-intern him. Another one is Jewel Bruce. So in 1917, when the U.S. declares war, he doesn't wait to get drafted, he enlists on his own. 
He uh, gets put in the 5th Infantry Division, and he sees heavy combat. He goes from a private to a first sergeant within just a few months of serving, if that tells you how much action he saw. But in one of those battles, he gets gassed. And even though he's, when he's discharged, there's no mention that he has any respiratory issues, but they keep getting worse and worse. They set up a hospital in Johnson City, Tennessee, that's specifically for people who have been gassed and have respiratory issues from it. He's, he's sent there, and they basically said, there's nothing we can do for you. Just go home and live out your life. And at 26, just a few years after he got discharged from the army, he died from being gassed just a few years earlier. And I don't know if any of you are long time Spring, or how many of you are long time Spring Hill residents, but this is Gladys Watson, who used to run the telephone office in Spring Hill. She was his girlfriend before the war. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, when you said about that person being gassed, my great grandpa, great grandpa Jesse Vernon Thomas, was also gassed in World War One, and he um, died in 1927. Yeah, so he he probably had the same issue, just he never recovered from it. Yeah, but he died. He 